Now, after knowing about prediction, what we can do to prevent preeclampsia? Is there anything we can do in order to halt the pathophysiology or the pathogenesis that is happening inside the body? So, the answer is yes. We can go in for a calcium supplementation at least 1.5 to 2 grams per day. And it is recommended for women with low calcium intake, right? So, if a woman who has adequate calcium levels, this might not prevent preeclampsia. But a woman who is known to have uh, hypocalcemia, uh, not hypocalcemia per se, but low dietary intake of calcium, there calcium supplementation has a proven role. I will be discussing about the mechanism a little later. Secondly, uh, low dose aspirin, yes. So, it was previously given in the dosage of 75 milligrams per day, that to HS, that is Borasomni at night. And more recently, after the aspirin trial came into picture, we have uh, seen that the recommended dose has been doubled to 150 milligrams per day and it should be administered daily starting pre-pregnancy ideally in women who have known risk factors or even if you've diagnosed after pregnancy at least uh, prior to 16 weeks of gestation somewhere around 12 weeks uh, and you have to continue it till 36 weeks of gestation and even you can discontinue it two days prior to expected date of delivery. So prevention of preeclampsia Two basic pillars are calcium supplementation and low dose aspirin. So, how does this aspirin act? Aspirin is what? It is an NSAID, that is, it's a non steroidal anti inflammatory drug. Aspirin for this indication, that means prevention of preeclampsia, should be started even earlier than 12 weeks, ideally pre pregnancy. We know that defective placentation is considered as the causative factor of preeclampsia. So, what does aspirin do? Early aspirin basically balances the levels of thromboxane A2 and prostacyclin which will maintain adequate utroplacental blood flow and improve the placentation without increasing the risk of adverse maternal and perinatal outcome. Understand this. It's an NSAID. It is a COX inhibitor. Right? That means it inhibits cyclooxygenase. Now, this cyclooxygenase is responsible for generation of thromboxane A2 by platelets and generation of prostacyclins by the endothelial cells. Whenever we give aspirin, it is going to act on both. So, it will decrease thromboxane A2 which is a pro-platelet aggregator and it will also decrease uh, prostacyclins which are anti-platelet aggregators. Now, the question arises, if it is decreasing both the pro-aggregators and the anti-aggregators, how is it so that it is preventing preeclampsia? The answer lies in the fact that we know that platelets are anucleate, right? So, whatever amount of thromboxane they have, if you counteract that, they cannot make new thromboxane. On the other hand, the endothelial cells which secrete prostacyclins definitely have a nucleus. So, even if little amount of prostacyclin is antagonized, they will generate more and more of prostacyclins. So, that is the reason why it favors the ratio in, uh, uh, it favors the ratio for more and more of prostacyclins and less of thromboxanes. So, ultimate effect is anti-platelet aggregatory. Understood? Because of the fact that it is not allowing the platelets to aggregate, it is not allowing microthrombi formation, it improves placental uh, flow and the usual placental blood flow is to an extent where it does not result in an insufficiency and there is adequate amount of oxygenation to the fetus. So therefore, it appears to be safe to use a low-dose aspirin prophylaxis to prevent preeclampsia throughout pregnancy, ideally starting pre-pregnancy and continue it two days prior to delivery or cesarean section. What are these high-risk groups where we need to give aspirin? So, again, straight away from the NICE uh, guidelines. So, the high-risk factors are if the woman has had any history of preeclampsia in previous pregnancy, she is a known case of chronic kidney disease. She has uh, diabetes type 1 or type 2. She is a known case of autoimmune disorder like SLE, rheumatoid arthritis or anything otherwise. Or she is a known case of chronic hypertension. These are the high risk factors for preeclampsia. And what are the moderate risk factors? If it's a first pregnancy, uh, the age of the woman is more than 40 years of age. Pregnancy interval of more than 10 years. So an interpregnancy interval of more than 10 years. BMI of more than 35, a family history of preeclampsia. So understand, history of preeclampsia in previous pregnancy is a high risk factor, 
whereas the family history of preeclampsia is a moderate risk factor and lastly multiple pregnancies so you have to use aspirin if there is even a single high risk factor or there are two or more moderate risk factors so that is the indication for providing a woman with aspirin so high risk factors again history of preeclampsia and previous pregnancy chronic kidney disease diabetes chronic hypertension or an autoimmune disorder moderate risk factors of first pregnancy age more than 40 bmi more than 35 interpregnancy interval of more than 10 years family history of preeclampsia or multiple pregnancy one high risk factor or more than one moderate risk factor one has to institute aspirin therapy so after knowing about the role of aspirin in prevention of preeclampsia i told you i'll be discussing about calcium so it is said that the possibility that calcium may prevent preeclampsia was born of epidemiologic observations of a low incidence of this condition in populations with high calcium intake so where uh, we have seen women with high calcium intake the incidence of preeclampsia is low so how do we um, go about the fact that what does calcium do in order to prevent preeclampsia so it is said that calcium may prevent preeclampsia by decreasing the release of parathormone and consequently there uh, the intracellular calcium concentration is decreased resulting in decreased bone muscle contractility so basically if you are eating more and more of calcium there is a good amount of calcium in the blood it will give a negative feedback to parathormone being released by the c cells uh, sorry being released by the parathyroid glands and this parathormone when decreases results in a decrease intracellular calcium concentration and we know that calcium is essential for the actomyosin bond formation and when this uh, muscle is deprived of calcium there is a decreased smooth muscle contractility and again this decrease in risk was greater in women at high risk for developing hypertension and in women with a diet deficient in calcium so use calcium in women who are already known to be deficient and the dosage at which it needs to be used is 1.5 to 2 grams a so a uh, fifth of a long way discussing about uh, the etiopathogenesis the screening the diagnosis the management prevention prediction now uh, just a word about certain common trials which have taken place as far as hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are discussed so we have certain trials you remember the names and i'll be telling you in brief about these trials so hypertat 1 hypertat 2 the phoenix trial the magpie trial the aspre trial the spre trial the bump trial and the dapa study okay so we'll be talking about these um, in brief so hypertat 2 um, hypertat 1 hypertat 2 more or less the same they are randomized control trials which basically investigated whether you need to deliver the woman immediately or you want to do an expectant management in cases of severe and non severe preeclampsias so the findings show that in women diagnosed between 34 to 37 weeks of gestation immediate delivery uh, might reduce the small risk of adverse maternal outcomes compared with expectant monitoring so based on these two trials we had our limits of uh, timing the delivery 37 weeks for non severe preeclampsia and 34 weeks for severe preeclampsia so that is what hypertat 1 and hypertat 2 are all about next comes the phoenix trial right so phoenix stands for pre eclampsia in hospital early induction or expectant management again so it is a randomized control trial which basically uh, weighs the risks versus benefits of expectant management as compared to an early induction in women who are between 34 to 37 weeks of gestation right so that is the phoenix trial now the magpie trial was a large international study again an rct which compares use of maxil uh, with placebo for women with preeclampsia and certainly showed that magnesium sulfate halves the relative risk of eclampsia without appearing to have substantial harmful effects on either the mother or the baby so it was the magpie trial which established a firm footing of magnesium sulfate as the drug of choice as the cornerstone of management of eclampsia and we know that it is the first line anticonvulsant therapy and that is proven by the magpie trial so we have learned about the hypertat 1 hypertat 2 phoenix magpie next is the bump trial 
So what is the BUMP trial? It stands for Blood Pressure Monitoring in High Risk Pregnancy to improve the detection and monitoring of hypertension. So how uh, do you monitor the blood pressure in high risk pregnancy? How frequently do you monitor whether you take the mean arterial pressure or the systolic or the diastolic? That all has been deliberated upon in the BUMP trial. And DAPA stands for a diagnostic accuracy in preeclampsia using proteinuria assessment. That is the DAPA study. Uh, more important studies are the ASPRAY and the SPRI, which are pretty recent. So this ASPRAY is a combined multi-marker screening and RCT uh, where we basically see for aspirin pre-treatment for evidence-based preeclampsia prevention. Now it was designed to test the hypothesis that among women who are identified as being high risk for preterm preeclampsia on the basis of the above mentioned factors, aspirin at a dose of 150 milligrams per day taken right away from 11 weeks of gestation until 36 weeks would result in a decreased incidence of preterm preeclampsia. Almost it halves the incidence. So aspirin trial is nothing. It is basically aspirin in prevention of preeclampsia and it establishes the dose of 150 milligrams per day as against the prior 75. Starting it off right away from 11 weeks of gestation continuing up to 36 weeks of gestation and it says with significance that the incidence of preterm preeclampsia can be certainly halved with this intervention. The next is the SPRI study, the screening program for preeclampsia study, where again the participants were uh, those having singleton pregnancies at uh, 11 to 13 weeks of gestation, where we took up into account all those factors which I talked about, the maternal risk factors, the mean arterial pressure, the uterine artery pulsatility index, the serum placental growth factor and the serum PAP A levels. And with that, the performance of screening for preeclampsia uh, was compared with that of the Bayes theorem by the NICE method. So, uh, this is basically uh, taking into account the high risk factors and correlating with the level and the accuracy with which they can predict preeclampsia. So, understood? We talked about the hypertat 1, hypertat 2, the Phoenix trial based uh, on the timing of delivery. The MACPI trial, which tells you that yes, Maxil is definitely uh, going to reduce the risk of eclampsia without uh, much of adverse effects on the mother and the baby. The ASPRAY trial, aspirin dosing in preeclampsia. The SPRI trial, which screens women with preeclampsia uh, with certain maternal factors, certain biochemical factors, and certain sonographic indices. And the BUMP and the DAPA study uh, for blood pressure monitoring and proteinuria assessment, respectively. So, uh, after this, uh, just a word on the long-term surveillance of this women. Uh, so, it's not an end of the journey that they deliver and they'll be all right. It is a proven fact that they have certain long-term health uh, effects, adverse effects in the form of chronic hypertension, ischemic heart disease. They're on a higher risk of cerebrovascular disease, kidney disease, diabetes mellitus, risk of thromboembolism and hypothyroidism. So, every mother should be advised regarding the long-term surveillance as preeclampsia definitely increases the risk of all these um, adverse uh, events in the future life of the 